It is a pleasure to present here today, although only virtually, this work on book binding structure, recording and visualization. A work that is a collaboration with Rachel de Crash and her team at the University of Toronto. Part of the Mellon funded project, The Book and the Sick Roads. New approaches to the global history of the book, a project that is led by Alex Gillespie. When we see how researchers typically approach the study and description of book bindings, we notice two main perspectives. One that is mainly focused on external appearance of bindings, and the other that considers both inside and the outside of these objects. The first approach considers the visible elements of the binding, basic leaks cover, and decoration tooling in particular, following what can be seen as an art history approach to binding history. The literature on the subject is plentiful, and in fact, one could say that up to the 1970s, the history of book binding was virtually equal to the history of book binding decoration, with bindings being dated, grouped, and located based on the identification and the use and reuse of tools. The main problem with such an approach is that only minority on bindings are actually tooled, and if all we can say about the binding is in regard with this decoration, we will be extremely limited in the scope of book binding studies, and we will be able to say very little about the books such as these on the screen, for example. A second approach looks at the binding in its entirety, and following archaeological methodology, studies its structures and materials, cover and decoration included. Now, the number of basic structures in book bindings considered under the archaeological approach is limited to 10 or so in the very complex bindings. But if one starts to look at all the variables in these structures, the number of permutations increases drastically. And it is in these variations that the book archaeologist reads the data to help date, group, and locate bindings on top of the information that we can gather from the decoration. All in all, then, books are actually complex entities, and it is shown here that even in the case of a simpler binding structure, such as limp parchment bindings, and in this slide you see that each of these numbers points to a particular component of such binding. But the problem is that in order to describe an object such as this, one needs more than mere listings of its component, as we will see. There is, in fact, a difference between heaps of parts, of lists of parts, if you want, and well structure holes, as there is a difference between all the material components that come together to make a motorbike and a motorbike in working order, where all its, its components are arranged spatially in a precise and established configuration. To describe complex entities such as bookbinding structures, one, therefore, will need to convey information not only on the material components, all the elements that come together to make the object, but also on their configurations. How are these spatially linked to each other and how do they work together? And we refer to this spatial configuration as the form of that object. Traditionally, as we'll see, we find different kinds of bookbinding descriptions in the literature, but not all of these are well equipped to describe unequivocally the structural holes that these bindings are. The problem generally lies in the communication of their form. How are the components put together? What is the spatial configuration of all these components? The first kind of description relies on free text that follows the rules of natural language communication. In this particular case on the slide, we have the description of a particular kind of sewing structure that is referred to as nocturnal sewing. Now, the fact that the text is in German doesn't help if you don't speak German, of course, but even in translation, the explanation of the spatial configuration of the thread around the sewing support, how the sewing is actually constructed, how the knot in the middle of the double uh, sewing support is formed, is rather difficult to follow. And this is because the communication of the form of such a structure is blurred and imprecise. A particular kind of non-structure verbal description had been attempted by Pamela Spitzmuller and Gary Frost, and they used these to describe sewing structures. 
they used basically a formulaic natural language descriptions in which most of the information was coded, relying on pre-established vocabularies and expressions. The results are actually compelling, and in fact the form of the solving structure seems to be fairly well conveyed. But I think that the case here is that these descriptions are successful thanks to the same sequential nature of information that follows the root of the thread as it moves around the sewing structure to sew the book. I fear that more complex structures, they don't have such a very defined sequentiality of the, of the elements and of the uh, structure, would make this communication rather, again, blurry and precise. Scholars seem to be aware of the limits of verbal descriptions. And in fact, if one looks in the literature, we find that most binding descriptions rely on diagrams and drawings to really illustrate the material components and the form of the binding structures. More recently, we see that more and more people rely on structural descriptions within databases helped with controlled vocabularies using technologies such as XML, JSON, and RDF to describe binding structures in a more guided way. The database structures, in fact, permits the users to input systematic descriptions that follow well-structured hierarchical schemas. And it is in the hierarchical nature of these descriptions that one can find preserve the form of the binding structure. So even though it will look like we only have lists of components within a database, within the hierarchy of the database, we actually can we can find and read and communicate the form of the binding structures as well. Capitalizing on this notion that the hierarchies within databases are able to convey the form of an object, during my PhD, at the Legato Research Center of the University of the Arts London, I took data from XML description of bindings from the library on Sunny, and through a series of ad hoc scripts, I had the computer read and retransform the information within the database and generate automatically the same kind of drawings and diagrams that, as we've seen, people generally utilize to convey information about the form of book binding structures. Now, there are many reasons that make such automated visualizations valuable tools, despite the fact that they are limited by the prototypical nature of the information they can gather. In particular, as I presented a few years back here at CC15, these automated visualizations allow users to check for the accuracy of data within databases, thanks to the fact that these diagrams are more immediate in their communicative powers for what concerns forms and components within binding structures. On these premises, then, we started a conversation with Alex Gillespie and their team in Toronto to take such an approach, the one that I did for my PhD, and build on it with more uh, capabilities for what concerns the technologies. And now I leave the word to Rachel, who will illustrate a prototype of a system that we were working on that takes the steps from what I did for my PhD and allows us to describe bindings visually. Thank you, Alberto. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Rachel DeCrush, and I'm a project librarian at the University of Toronto Libraries, and I manage the technical development for the Book in the Silk Roads project, which is a two-year internationally collaborative project funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. And the team is co-principal investigators Alexander Gillespie of University of Toronto Mississauga, Sean Meikle of the University of Toronto Libraries, and Suzanne Akbari of the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton. 
A goal of this project is to bring together scholars and experts in a variety of fields to tell a more nuanced story of the book. One that differs from our sort of traditional story in which we have the tablet that then becomes the scroll to the biblical codex to the Gutenberg Bible and then today's digital age. We are working with a wide network of collaborators to tell many stories of the books from, with people from many regions and different periods within this sort of wider story of the past. Our technical team consists of two application developers, Shibo Liu and Imran Askar, who are responsible for building the deliverables. Bilal Khaled and Andy Wagner are senior application developers who act as technical advisors, and a network services team in the department who ensures our team has the necessary infrastructure support to complete our work. Today, I'd like to discuss one aspect of the technical team's work, the development of a web application to visualize binding structures in a 3D space. Our hope is that through this work, we can improve the ease with which users can create binding drawings, provide a helpful teaching tool, move towards standardizing description of bindings, expand beyond codices to other types of books, and to allow users to use their models in other platforms at their discretion. To do this, we looked to Alberto's work at automated binding structures and felt that we could build upon what he had already achieved in collaboration with him. Our reference points for this work centered around Legatus data model to get an idea of the types of information that can be recorded about a book binding structure and how those pieces might relate to one another. In addition, the language of bindings vocabulary was used to help standardize descriptions of these objects while also designing the tool in such a way that this could be expanded upon in our application to include other types of terms, especially those from other types of book traditions. Some of the challenges we anticipated regarding this work include usability issues. So the, the ability to show visually enough detail that the object is useful to look at and tells you useful information, but not so detailed and complex that it actually becomes difficult for a user to understand what they're looking at. In addition, we understood that showing the directionality of threads or the way in which it actually moves through the binding was very important for users to understand. Um, in diagrams, this is often shown with arrows to dictate where exactly the thread is moving. Um, we also knew that users often required multiple views of the same feature in order to fully understand its function in the diagram. We decided to start off work by focusing on the simpler features that could make up a codex, such as boards, coverings, leaves, joints, and other features. This is where most of our work has centered until this point. We will now move into the more complex structures of the bindings, which include end bands and sewing. In addition, we want to focus on user needs that would help them understand a binding visualization better and thus make it particularly useful in their work. Um, these needs include showing the directionality of thread, uh, to be able to view the same feature from different angles, the ability to show all aspects of a binding at once, or to show a more stripped down version to really hone in a specific aspect, and the ability to indicate confidence level of what you're actually uh, drawing out. Now I'd like to quickly show just a few demos of the application that's currently under development. As you can see here, we have the book in a 3D space right now, and the user is able to manipulate it at will to see it from all different angles, as well as zooming in and zooming out. Uh, we thought that this was a good way to address the uh, need to see the same feature from different angles. So rather than having multiple images, um, you can actually just sort of manipulate it as needed. In addition, you could change the view of the object if you just wanted to focus in on the spine of it, as well as open uh, one side of the book um, so that you could actually see the board and how it is connected to the book block. So you could close it and open it, all that kind of stuff that a user can do as needed. In addition, we also included a lots of features that you could change of the book that you could record. So as you can see here, measurements about the text block, the book board dimensions, as well as all different features of the, um, of the book that include spine lining boards, all that kind of thing stuff. And we're gonna show a couple here of how you might actually change these. So for example, you show here that um, you could change the board um, if to have a no lining. You could also apply a layer to it that would show what type of wood it might be, or if it's not wood, what other context it might be. Um, and here you can see that when you remove the spine lining, you can actually kind of see some of the etching that's into the board, for example. Um, in addition to this, uh, you could also add sewing supports. Um, we have sort of pre-programmed a few types here already. Um, and again, 
then just like the uh, boards, you could also indicate whether or not uh, what type of material is actually made out of. So here we have a few, um, we will change to leather and, and the same will apply for coverings that might exist over uh, boards as well. Um, so as you can see here, um, we have sort of uh, created uh, textures over top of the uh, sewing supports to kind of give the idea of a leather uh, sewing support here. In this demo, I'm going to show a few of the application features that you can use in this app. So right now the book has a covering over top of it. Uh, that's what the blue thing is, but there are a few features off to the left in which you can change, in particular this opacity setting. So what you can do with this is actually change the level of uh, opacity of every type of feature um, so you can get a better idea of um, all the different pieces that go together. We thought this would be useful because um, maybe you want to see a very strip down version of something, a sort of a particular feature that you want to hone in on. And other times, maybe you want to see how multiple pieces go together. And you could also sort of change the level so you could maybe see a multi-layered um, model that shows sort of the outer parts, the inner parts all together in one, uh, in one sort of view, which might not be possible. And so here I'm just sort of manipulating some of them to give an idea. For example, like removing the text block, you can really see the uh, attachments to the boards here. In addition, you're able to export this. So you can do a 3D model, which we could use in other applications, but also just a simple PNG um, that will give you that sort of view that you're currently looking at at the object. The final thing that I want to show is an experimentation that we've been do when playing with. So uh, I mentioned before about the directionality of thread, the way the fact that it's very important to know the way in which that thread is actually moving throughout the entire object. Um, and traditionally, this has been done in a lot of um, uh, images using uh, arrows. Um, we felt that that was definitely a way that we could go. Um, we were slightly worried that sometimes that might become a little bit muddled or difficult to understand. So we wanted to do a little bit of an experiment since we were already sort of in this 3D space of kind of what other types of ways could we show directionality that might be very useful uh, to the user. And in this one, we sort of landed on a animation. And this is a very uh, a prototype. Uh, this is uh, very basic. It doesn't really uh, go anywhere or anything like that. Um, but it's just to give an idea of what we might be able to do uh, with this feature to address that user need of directionality. Um, so as you can see here, um, we have sort of these thread pieces that are stuck out. If you select uh, the sewing at the bottom, um, you can actually kind of use it as a little video player and it'll take you through sort of the way in which that thread might be moving through uh, the, the uh, text block or the boards. As the demos showed, users will be able to manipulate a binding in real time as desired. But you may be wondering how a user might be able to build a model from scratch. Another aspect of our BSR technical development will, in addition to other types of data, house an input form, which can be used to record binding information, which can also be imported and exported to be used offline. This data will then be used to produce the types of 3D models shown in the demos. We've attempted to extrapolate the data model to extend beyond a codex-centric design in the hopes that we can include many different types of books in our description forms and eventually our models. For example, here we have the word substrate to represent the surface upon which a text is written. As stated, our next phase of work will focus on producing a few complex structures, a few types of sewings, and a few types of end bands. In addition, we will expand the ability to show material textures as well as confidence levels of each feature. Finally, we will create an input form in which users can describe a binding from which a model can then be produced. In closing, I would like to point out that we see this application as being just one piece of the story to be told about a book and can be used alongside other tools and methods, such as the micro CT videos and images of hidden structures shown on this slide and diagrams of a book's collation, as well as others which may move towards telling a more complex and more complete story of the book. Thank you very much for your time and please feel free to reach out if you have any questions or comments. Thank you so much.